I want by a show of upraised hands, how many of you did something dumb when you were young? Yeah, right. How many of you did a lot of dumb things when you were young, right? My hand is up on that. Both hands are up on that. Uh, yeah, and so I definitely fit into that category. I, I think back to when I was like really young or a teenager or whatever else. I'm like, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Um, when I was really, really young, I wanted to be a daredevil. And so uh, this is going to date me. I grew up in the 70s. There was a guy by the name of Evil Knievel that I thought was the best thing since microwave popcorn. You know, it was just like... He was amazing. He's this daredevil. How many of you remember remember him? Okay, yep, we're the old ones in the room, right? So anyway, he would like take a motorcycle and jump over buses and cars. Uh, he one time jumped his motorcycle over the Caesars Palace, like fountain in Las Vegas. He uh, got in a rocket and he launched across the Grand Canyon, only made it part of the way, he still lived. But uh, I used to carry his lunchbox. Going to grade school, I had an Evil Knievel metal lunchbox. And uh, I loved Loved him. And so when I was really, really young, um, I had a big wheel, and a big wheel is kind of like a, a tricycle, you could say, and uh, it's made of plastic, and it's really cool, and it has a big wheel in the front, thus the name of the big wheel. And what I would do is I would set up a ramp, I'd get a plywood wood sheet, and I'd put cinder blocks underneath it, and I would get to the top of our drive, and I would go as fast as I could, and I would launch off that thing, and I thought I was Evil Knievel. In fact, I even put matchbox cars down to jump over, and uh, I just thought it was the best. I went through big wheels. Like, I, I literally, I crashed these things so much that I had multiple of them because they kept breaking. In fact, I found this picture online, and this embodies, I think, my childhood right here. This is exactly what it was like. I loved it. I mean, that was just, that was me growing up, you know? And, 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 and then that daredevil thing kind of stuck with me. And the older I got, um, and when I got my teens, I kind of was still kind of crazy like that. And I remember one time after, right after we graduated from high school, I went on a road trip uh, with some friends out to Phoenix, Arizona, and we stopped at the Grand Canyon beforehand. I'd never been there before. Majestic place. And so we pulled up, and there was really just this, and I think it's still this way, there's only this really low fence, and it's like these wood beams, this low fence that kind of keeps you from the rim of the canyon, okay? And like the rim of the canyon is like a thousand feet down. And so obviously I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a daredevil. So I got over like the fence, which you're not supposed to do. And there was this freestanding rock. It was kind of like this boulder that was balancing, but there was about a seven foot gap or an eight foot gap or so between the rim of the canyon and this balancing freestanding rock. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know what? I can make it. <clears throat> I can, I can, if I get a running start, I can run and I could jump over that gap. Now, if I shorted it, I would go down a thousand feet, but I could make it over to this boulder. And so I all of a sudden looked at my friends and go, hey, watch this. And I did it and I jumped over. I made it. I turned around. I'm like, yes. It was that rocky moment, like when he got to the stop, top of the steps. I'm like, yes. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I really hadn't thought this through because it required a running start to get over the gap, but the boulder was not big enough to get a running start to get back. And all of a sudden, I became paralyzed in fear, literally. And the wind started to kind of like stir up in the canyon. I felt like I was kind of getting blown off of the edge. And so I got down on all fours, and I panicked. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they're going to have to have like first responders come and get me. So there are crowds starting to gather, you know, going, what is this moron doing? And I remember thinking to myself, I'm thinking, I, I could die. I mean, like, this is, this is like a big deal. And this is before iPhones, but I guarantee you, if iPhones were there, everybody would be like, hey, look at, watch this idiot. Watch what he's gonna do, you know, kind of a thing. And so the crowd started to gather, and finally, I just mustered up enough guts to take a couple of strides and, and, and put as much power into the leap as I could, and I got back across. And I immediately, though, had regret when I got myself into that situation. Like, immediately, when I got on that rock, I was like, what have I done. And today I want to talk about those moments of our lives where we do something and then we go, what have I done? Now, not maybe as foolish as jumping out onto a freestanding rock at the Grand Canyon. I'm talking about probably more important and significant things like, like why did I make that decision that really influenced the trajectory of my life? Why did I hang around that person? Why did I do that one thing? 
Why didn't I see that thing coming? Why didn't I make that decision? Why didn't I raise my kids a little differently and put a little bit more investment in them instead of spending time at the office? Why didn't I go down the right path sooner? Why did I give into that vice that now has become an addiction? Why didn't I love a little better? Why did I say that when I was angry? Why didn't I say something to that person when I should have? Why didn't I work hard? harder? Why didn't I act different? Why did I drop out of school? Why did I smoke that? Why did I drink that? Why did I do that? You see, there's all kinds of stuff that we do that we think in the moment, this is great. This is fun. This is awesome. It's a good choice. And then we get into it and then we're like, why did I do that? That was an awful mistake. And regret is powerful. Today, I'm gonna talk to you about how to overcome regret. And all of us have something to regret. All of us have something. And and this is the thing, regret weighs you down. As if life is not heavy enough as it already is, right? As you're going through life, you're already carrying a weight because life is heavy. We live in a hopelessly broken world. Bad things happen to us. Things happen around us. Sometimes we do bad things, whatever. It's already heavy. But then when you start putting regret into your bag, in a sense, when you start going, this is the wrong choice that I made. Now I have regret. Now I have mind games because I can't shake the feeling, it, it, it haunts me. I think back to that decision that I made or that instance that I did something and I am regretting that and I can't shake it and now I have consequences and all kinds of things that I deal with. Now all of a sudden I have a life that I feel like I have to live because that decision put me on a trajectory and it is heavy, right? And as you are trying to go through life, all of a sudden, you wanna run fast. Like, like when you grow up, when you're young, when you're on your big wheel, life is like, is exciting. There's all kinds of things to do, but then over time, more stuff goes in your bag in a sense, and it becomes heavier and heavier, and you regret certain things, and pretty soon you can't run fast. You can't move quickly. You can't be agile in life because you're carrying such a huge weight. So how do you deal with regret? How do we deal with this? Well, let's talk about that today because I wanna talk about the decisions in the past that have created mind games, consequences, and paralyzation, you could say. And if we could just go back in time, right, it would all be better. If we could find that time machine that we could get in and we could go get a mulligan, you could say, get a do-over and go back in time, that would be amazing, but unfortunately, they don't exist. In 1997, there was a magazine, a small magazine that had um, laid out uh, all of the publication. It was ready to go to print. And they discovered that on one of the pages, um, the person that was laying out everything had by mistake left a big uh, empty white space that had no copy on it, no pictures, no ads. And so the editor came along and goes, well, we, we can't go to print on this. There's a big empty space on one of the pages. And so he called one of his friends and he goes, hey, listen, um, do you want to, uh, in a sense, just put an ad in here for some Something, like maybe your business or whatever because we just got to fill the space and we got to get this thing off to print. And so the friend was like, sure, I'll do that. And so the friend decided that he was going to do something kind of funny, a little satire, and he put in an ad and this is how it read. Wanted somebody to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. P.O. Box 322, Oakview, California, 93022. You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons. Safety not guaranteed. I've only done this once before. And, and so him and the editor friend laughed about it, was like, oh, this is funny. Yeah, we'll put it in there. They laid it out, went to print, published the magazine, it got distributed, and little did this guy know that dozens and dozens and dozens of letters were gonna be mailed to him of people who said, I'm in. Now this says two things. Number one, it speaks to the gullibility of our culture. (laughs) But number two, I think more importantly, it speaks to how badly we wish 
that sometimes we could go back in time to a certain instance or circumstance, right? You wish you could go back to the first time that you met that person and go, yeah, instead of like falling in love, I think I would run like crazy, right? Or you could go back to that decision that you made for your business that ended up putting you in five years of financial hardship and a tight cash flow. Or you, you wish you could go back to that argument you had with your spouse and you wish you wouldn't have said those things. You could, you could do it over again. See, I wish we could do that, but unfortunately we can't. And, and, and I know you know this, you're, you're smart, you know this. What is done is done. But the good news is this, is regret is only as powerful as you let it be. All right, do you hear that? It's only as powerful. And today, I'm gonna give you the steps to take to overcome regret. If you apply these steps, you will overcome regret. And you sit there and say, boy, that's pretty confident, Jer. You know why? It's because I'm getting them directly out of the word of God. This is not my wisdom, this is God's wisdom. And the apostle Paul is writing about Regret. He's writing about the stuff in the past. He's writing about his actions. And listen, the Apostle Paul was not a good guy before he met Jesus. In fact, he, we believe that he had tortured, he might have even killed individuals that did not believe what he believed about faith. He was a religious terrorist. The person that wrote over half of the New Testament that were originally letters and we compiled it into what we call the New Testament of the Bible, originally he was a religious fanatic and terrorist that was willing to snuff out people that did not agree with his religion. Think about that. So when he is writing these words, he is writing them from a place of knowing what it's like to be bad and make wrong decisions and how to move past that and past regret. So what does he say? In the book of Philippians, which originally was a letter to the church of Philippi, chapter three, verses 12 to 15, he says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Okay, what is he talking about here? What he's talking about is this, is in previous verses, he's going, I wanna experience the power of God in my life. He's like, I want to experience resurrection power, the, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I want to experience that, and I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he was basically leaning into. He wants to totally understand and live a life that's full of God's power and is in alignment with God's commands. But then he says this, but I haven't achieved that yet. I haven't achieved that yet. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. In other words, he's gonna continue to press on to the life that God wants him to live. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. All right, on the count of three, let's all say one thing, okay? One, two, three, one thing. What is the one thing? What is the one thing? Forgetting. What is the one thing? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. There's so much gold in this verse. And I'm gonna do my best to tease out as much of the truth that Paul is writing about in the remaining time that we have together. So listen closely, take copious notes, because I think this is the way to overcome regret. First thought is this, Paul is a religious leader over the first century church. He, he would kind of, I was trying to think of an, you know, some sort of an analogy. It's kind of like how the Catholics look to the Pope as the leader of the church, all right? Many uh, in the first century church looked at, at Paul as a leader like that over the church. So this is, a, this is like a high-ranking spiritual dude, okay? And what is the very first thing that he says? What a lot of religious leaders do not admit. He says this, I don't have it together yet. I, I wanna just say that because a lot of pastors and a lot of religious leaders, you may look at them and go, well, their life is perfect. They know what they're doing. They're in tune with God. No, Paul says, I still have a long ways to go. I do not know 
everything I need to know. I do not obey everything that I need to obey. And so here is Paul saying what the first step of overcoming regret is, and that is this. The first step to losing regret is to admit that we don't have it all together. Now that sounds too simple, but it's actually profound because we have to get to a place where we acknowledge that we are struggling with regret over a decision or a choice that we made. And regret is usually a private battle, not a public fight. In fact, when you go to the office tomorrow, when you go to school tomorrow, you say, hey, John, how you doing? John is not gonna look back at you and go, well, I'm actually struggling with regret. You know, I've been up all night. I can't sleep because I regret or whatever. We don't admit when we regret. In fact, we may battle regret and nobody around us, including our spouse, including our parents, including our children, including our best friend, nobody around us may even realize we're struggling with regret because regret is a silent killer. Regret is something that you battle on the inside and, and you front everybody on the outside. You don't walk around saying, yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with regret. You never hear that, right? But we all have to acknowledge we've made mistakes. We don't many times know what we're doing, right? And many times we do the wrong things. We're far from perfect. This is what Paul is modeling for us as the super Christian of his era, as the main, or at least one of the main, I, you'd argue between him and the apostle Peter, but one of the main spiritual leaders of his day, he is saying, I don't have it all together. I've not attained yet my desire. I'm not perfect. In fact, let's just do this. Let's have a moment of catharsis here. Turn the person next to you, look them right in the eye and say this, I am not perfect. Go ahead, come on, do it. Don't you feel better? All right, now look at that person again. Look them right in the eye and say this. Trust me, I know that. <laughs> Some of you spouses, you just had a moment, right? I mean, you're like, wow, it's the first time that he or she has ever admitted that they were wrong. I mean, right, okay, okay. Regret will keep you its slave if it keeps you from admitting that you don't have it all together. We have to admit we haven't done everything right. This is hard for some of us to do. Some of us, we, we, it's hard for us to say, you know what, I was not right in that conversation. I did not make the right decision. I did the wrong thing. But that's where it needs to start. It needs to start with honesty. And honesty means truthfulness. That's what honesty means, that you're truthful about the situation. What's the second step? The second step to losing regret is to keep uh, trying to live the life Jesus empowers us to live, to keep living that life. Now, now again, this sounds too simple, doesn't it? You're like, okay, Jer, you're, you're saying that we admit that we don't have it all together, and then your second step is you're saying that we keep on trying to be like Jesus. Give me something new. No, listen, this is important. And the way that Paul, uh, in a sense, frames this is he goes, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. In other words, that in Jesus, I can find that life that I'm supposed to live because Jesus brokered that kind of life for me on the cross. But the reality is it's very hard to live that life because we live in this culture in this hopelessly broken world. And so at the end of the day, I think my point here is this, we give up too easy. We give up too easy. Some of you, you gave your life to Jesus. You gave it a shot. You went through starting your journey. You were excited and then you made a mistake and you're like, that didn't work then. This whole God thing didn't work. Or you're living a little cautiously because you deep down inside, you're thinking, you know what? I want to live a God-centered, Jesus-centered life, but every time I try to do it, I fail. And so after a while, you just kind of give up and you're like, you know what? I think I'm just going to be destined to be kind of average or below average or not religious or whatever else. And this is the thing, don't give up. 
Our society gives up way too easy. We give up on marriages. We give up on managing our finances. We give up on diets. We give up on our dreams. Because when it gets hard, we just go, oh, I can't do it. And we get discouraged and then we just give up. Paul says, no, I continue to press forward. I continue to do that. He just admitted he doesn't have it all together. And then his very next breath is, but I'm not giving up. And I'm paraphrasing, but I'm not giving up. Don't give up. Why? Because Jesus has not given up on you. Now, that may sound like a bumper sticker, all right? And you're like, oh, that's kind of that's cheesy. No, 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 listen, listen. Jesus, the one that created you, the one that saved you, the one that loves you, the one that died for you, that rose from the dead, he believes in you. Do you hear that? He really does. He believes in you. He put destiny on your life. He wants to help you realize that destiny and that purpose. He believes on you. In fact, this is the way I'd say it as your pastor. You can give up when Jesus gives up on you. All right? Which is never, by the way. He's never gonna give up on you. Don't give up. Be like a picture of this mouse. Go for your cheese. Come on. Don't give up. Try a little harder. I know you're like, I've already tried. No, you can give me a dozen reasons why you cannot improve in your relationship with Jesus or improve in your relationship with your spouse or your relationship with your kids or your business or whatever area of your life. You can give me dozens of reasons, but I can give you 5,467 reasons why that you can you say, what do you mean 5,467 reasons why I can? It's because there are 5,467 promises in the word of God that God says he is with you, that you are victorious, that his strength is in you. Do not give up. 5,467 promises for you. Do you hear that? Don't give up. Third step, how do you overcome regret? Well, the third step to losing regret is to focus forward to focus forward. So we admit we don't have it all together. We don't give up even though we failed before. And we focus our heart, our eyes forward in faith. How does Paul frame this? He basically frames it this way. No, dear brothers, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and what? Looking where? forward to what lies ahead. It is really, really hard to drive a car safely forward looking into the rear view mirror all the time. I want you to think about this. You pull out the parking lot today. I want you, you know, think about if you did this. You're gonna pull out, you're gonna get in your car and you are gonna drive forward by looking in the rear view mirror 100% of the time. If you do that, even if you look in the rearview mirror 50% of the time, it is dangerous. It is not safe. You will most likely hit something. You know what's even harder? Is trying to live a fulfilling life when you spend the majority of your time looking into your past. And some of us do that. We look at the past and the decisions we make and the situations that happened and all we're doing is we're focusing backwards and God wants us to drive forward with faith, eyes of faith looking forward to what Jesus has for us, but we keep looking backwards. And even, this is another thing, you might not even thought of this, you might be looking backwards to good times, not just bad times. Maybe you're looking back to the good old days before things did become hard and you're like, I wish that life was like when I was a kid. I wish that I was a teenager again. I wish that I was a young adult. I wish I was in my 30s, I, whatever it is. And you look back to maybe good times and you are also driving your life dangerously because you cannot move forward by wishing that things were the way that they were. And so many of us know this. And again, I'm gonna say it. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're smart, you get this, but I just need to say it. You can't change it. You are where you are. Okay, like right now, you are where you are. What is done is done. It is what it is. You can't wish it away. So here's the question. 
Can you believe with faith, focusing on your future, that God has a better plan and a better future for your tomorrow? Can you believe that? Rather than focusing on the past, it's done. You, you, you cannot change it. You said that thing. You did that thing. You smoked that thing. Whatever it was, okay? You cannot change it. But I'll tell you what you can change. You can start with your present to change your future in the power of Jesus. You can change your future. Your past does not determine your future. You know what the enemy does? The enemy always wants you to think about your past. In fact, he's trying to get you to live in your past so you are distracted from your present so that it ruins your future. I wanna say that again. He wants you to live in your past, whether it's good or bad, he wants you to live in your past so that you are distracted from your future, or excuse me, distracted from your present so that it ruins your future. It's kind of like when you talk to somebody who's constantly on their cell phone when you're trying to have a conversation. They're distracted, right? They're distracted from the moment. They're distracted from what's going on. Well, that's what the enemy does. He shows us pictures in our memory of our past. And he wants us to be distracted from our present because his desire is to ruin our future. The enemy is always trying to remind us of our past. So this is an old saying, I didn't make this up. But when the enemy reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. <laughs> and he sit there and go, what do you mean? I've, I've read the book of Revelation. It's a little trippy. I've read the book of Revelation. And the enemy's future is not a positive future. Not at all. So when he tries to remind you of your past, you just say, hey, devil, I just like to take a moment and remind you of your future. Because this is the thing. I'm not gonna focus in on my past. Regarding your future, the most important decision that you may ever make is the decision you make immediately after you fail. I wanna say that again. Regarding your future, the most important decision that you make is the one that you make right after you fail. Right after you fail. Because what do we do when we fail? Wanna give up? I mean, you trip up, you fall on your face, and you just wanna stay there. You know, <laughs> some of you are like, I, I, I'm trying to drink less. And so maybe even, I had somebody even tell me this, you know, that they are gonna give up alcohol for these 21 days because they felt like alcohol was their go-to. And maybe about halfway through this time, these 21 days, maybe you went and had a drink. And you're like, see, I can't do this. The most important decision you will ever make is the one you make after you take that drink. What are you gonna do now? Are you gonna fall right back into that same habit? You know, you're like, okay, in 2018, I committed. I was not gonna be at the office all the time. I was gonna be with my kids more. And I look back at 2018 and man, I felt like I was at the office too much. So what are you gonna do? The most important decision you will make is the one that you make after you fail. What are you gonna do about that? What are you gonna do about it? 2019 is a brand new year, baby. You hear that? Brand new year. I mean, it, 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 you gotta, gotta know that your future is still not written yet. Your past is etched in stone, but your future is not written. So what are you gonna do? You blow it, you, you made a mistake, you did something that you know you shouldn't do, you got angry and you promised yourself, I'm not gonna be angry anymore, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna yell, I'm not gonna be, be that person, and then you blow it and you blow your lid, and then, okay, the most important decision is what did you do then? After you blew your lid, what did you do then? Because most of the time, the enemy will say, yeah, see, you can't change. You are destined to fail. You will be who you are forever, right? No, the most important decision you can make is after you fail to get back up again. We used to say this in the youth ministry here for when I was running, you know, for, I was part of the youth ministry for 17 years. We used to say, quick down, quick up, quick down, quick up. So what do you do? You fall, you learn, you stand, you change. You fall, you learn, you stand up, you change. You fall, you learn, you stand, you change. You fall, you learn, you stand, you change. You fall, you learn, you stand, you change. You gotta keep doing that because if you stay down, that's when the enemy traps you. 
in guilt and despair and regret. Paul says, forget, forget what is in the past. Some of us are really good at forgetting, right? Can't find our keys or our phone half the time. But, but guess what? Paul actually is saying, forget the right things, the past. That's something you do need to forget. Those things that haunt you, those things that make you feel guilty, shameful, give them to Jesus. Give them to Jesus. Let him have them. He already knows about them, by the way. You're not showing him anything that's new. He already knows what you've done. So that leads me to the fourth and final step, and that's this, that the fourth step to losing regret is to move forward. Not just focus forward, now you gotta move. So it isn't just like knowing the right direction, it's that you start moving in the right direction. You start doing something about it, right? You don't just stay paralyzed in regret, but now you're focusing in the right direction and you move. I love what one version of this verse, it's the uh, passion version, says this, I run straight. I love that, I run straight. You know, like if you're running track, you don't run like zigzag. You know, you're not like serpentine, 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 right, right? You run straight. If it's a 100 yard dash, you run straight. So I run straight for the divine invitation of searching, re reaching, excuse me, the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Run, get going. Life is too short to be stuck in regret. Do you hear that? It's too short to be stuck in regret.